Okay, welcome, welcome to the one major substantive, non-opening, non-closing international, the plenary at this conference. Um, so I'm going to ask all of the panelists to come and enter the stage right now. I will say that we have never in the history of this conference had such a distinguished group of people together for a DPA plenary session. You know, and I will introduce them in a moment. From, yes, everybody, Diego Fernando, please. Yeah. And I will also open by giving my apologies because some of the names I struggle with in terms of pronunciation. But let me just begin here and saying, you know, since the origins of Drug Policy Alliance, a major mission of the organization has been educating Americans about the innovations that are going on around the world. And for many years, for decades, in fact, we've looked to Europe, to Switzerland, to the Netherlands, many of you have heard the presentations, now, and others as well. At the same time, as many of you are also aware, the developments in Latin America, on the one hand in Uruguay, with the president proposing the legal regulation of marijuana, and we have a remarkable delegation from Uruguay at this conference now, but also with the former presidents of the Global Commission on Drug Policy, and now with current presidents in Guatemala and Colombia, saying it's time for a change. So we have the good fortune to have here today representatives we have from, uh, on the right hand over here, Zhao, and I will not mangle his last name, ask him to introduce himself, from Portugal, who has been the pioneer of Portuguese drug policy, which you've heard so much for many years. And then we have Diego Canepa, the president, Mujica in Uruguay, his chief of staff, the key point person in Uruguay on these policies. We have Fernando Carrera, who was the planning minister and is now the foreign minister of Guatemala and also the key person basically advising and helping the president with their drug policies, not just domestically, but even more importantly, internationally. So please welcome Fernando. And then we have, I will mangle his name, Indrit, he will explain his name, the pronunciation of his name, but who has been the coordinator, effectively the drug czar of the Czech Republic for many years under different governments and in all sorts of ways moving this country forward and playing a provocative role within Europe as well. So please welcome him from the Czech Republic. And in the case of New Zealand, we don't have somebody from the government, but even better, we have somebody who can explain the New Zealand policy probably better than anybody in the New Zealand government, and that's Ross Bell from the New Zealand Drug Policy Foundation. So I want to open this up first by you know, speaking first to the first two of the Europeans. And the thing I always ask them is that sometimes the Europeans come here and you ask them to talk about drug policy and what they, what they focus on is, you know, it's not as good as you think. And, and in fact, there's problems. And we got our right-wing government or this government that's in the way and preventing reform. And what they forget sometimes is how significant what's happening in Europe actually is relative to what we're dealing with in the United States, right? So I want to turn first to our representative of the Czech Republic, ask him to pronounce his name for me again, and then just to describe the, the Czech approach and also a little bit of an overview about where you see the most interesting developments in Europe. And then I'll turn to Joao. All right. H hello, everybody. So you can try to repeat my name, Indrich. <laughs> Indrich. Indrich. Those who can speak Spanish, I'm sure you can say rrr. Rrr. So if you say R with closed teeth, R, <laughs> that's in Drich. And you have to say R at the end. So anyway, so that's my name. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's my first name. And then you have Vobozil, the other. So, <laughs> so anyway, so Czech Republic. Um, I think the main point about Czech Republic, I was born under heavy totalitarian uh, regime. Uh, Stalinist communism. 
uh, which was there for more than 40 years. And it was after the two big wars in Europe. So I think uh, Europeans are very average and uh, very skeptical about everything. So they are skeptical about those big ideas uh, such as war on drugs. So I think that's the main point about whole Europe, not only Czech Republic. But in uh, 1989, the communist systems collapsed and the Berlin Wall fall. And, uh, and then uh, we ended up being with open borders because we had metal fencing literally around the whole country. So uh, our drug scene at that time was uh, kitchen labs me uh, producing methamphetamine, uh, home-based, homemade, no money involved for two decades. Just people uh, were demanding pleasure, so they were looking for drugs because the conventional drugs were not there. So they produced their own drugs. People planted marijuana in the gardens, and uh, that's how, how it went. At that time, during communist time, sorry, I'm, I don't want to be too long, it's just uh, short history. At that time, during communist time, uh, communists would say, well, we are in this paradise uh, 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 wealth country without capitalism, uh, and drugs and those things are implanted here by Western, uh, Western uh, secret services. So when the, when the wall fall and we realized we do have drug problem just hidden, uh, what do we do? Nobody thought of let's make a war on drugs. So let's make something sen sensible, uh, something that is not too expensive because uh, you know uh, the time in 90s when America was building double of prison cells to incarcerate people for drug offenses, we're trying to cut the, the prison cells down because it's too expensive. So, so very quickly, uh, it, the practice was actually decriminalization without having it formulated legally. And then 1998, uh, uh, we formulated this uh, and passed this bill, which uh, actually said, I don't, uh, I don't want to go too technical, which actually said that possession, personal, Possession of drugs, it's not criminal offense. Uh, I think at this time, most of European countries have it. I think apart, uh, European Union countries, apart from two, I think. But the practice is common everywhere. So the prison cells are not full of uh, drug, uh, people with drug offenses. And if there are people with drug offenses, the, the sentences are two years, three years for smuggling drugs or producing big amount, things like that. Um, 2010, we, we formulated another bit of legislation where we said, okay, so how do we deal with it within the, the framework of international uh, treaties and conventions, which is really a blockage for, for, for moving forward for us. And no Europeans want to kind of uh, fight against it. Uh, mainly because we know that we would get in trouble with US, for example, and uh, all those big countries. So, uh, so we formulated a possibility for government to decide the amount for personal use, which for example, in Czech Republic, it's 15 grams, grams for marijuana. Uh, I don't know, two grams for heroin, uh, two grams for, or 1.5 grams for heroin, two grams for methamphetamine, which is for personal use. You cannot be prosecuted for that if you found with the possession of, of those drugs. We also recently passed a bill on medical marijuana. <laughs> I, sh I should tell you, I'm a member of Conservative Party. <laughs> Uh, m all my predecessors were members of, of Conservative Party, but Conservative Party in our country is so something probably totally different to what I see in other pa parts of the world. <laughs> because for us, it's personal freedom. <laughs> it's a uh, government should have little say in on what you're doing in your home. That's what we believe. So that's why, that's why, for example, we have elections today and tomorrow, and the leader, lady, 
who is running for the Prime Minister on behalf of the Conservative Party. She was my MP I was working with uh, on the bill for uh, medical marijuana, for example. So this is how, how, it's, how it's done in Czech Republic. I think uh, we, we talked about it bef before the, this, uh, this session. Uh, we are, as I said, Europeans, we are very skeptical and we don't uh, fall for big ideas much. So if you ask Europeans, you would say, well, there is many problems and uh, we would like to go forward, but it's too much hassle. We are quite comfortable. For example, in Czech Republic, uh, among injecting drug users, there is uh, 0%, it's 0.1% of HIV positivity among injecting drug users. Because we introduce harm reduction across the whole country, in every single corner you find accessibility to harm reduction services. Maybe final, final idea about uh, Czech, uh, Czech policy, and this is how we believe it should go internationally. Uh, our main preamble in, in our national drug strategy is that reducing harms is, is the overall policy and overall philosophy. So harm reduction is not a type of service for us, but it's, it's an idea how to look at legislation, law enforcement, and the whole drugs policy. So I think that's, that's uh, very much Czech way of looking at things. Well, Indrid, thank you. Let me now turn to Jao from Portugal. Because, you know, for many years, we first we looked at the Dutch, right? With uh, the, the Dutch coffee shop system emerging in the late 70s and the 80s, the harm reduction emerging, especially in the Netherlands, even in the early 80s. Then it was the Swiss providing really international leadership on safe injection sites and on heroin maintenance, which have now spread. You now have heroin maintenance in Germany, in the Netherlands, in Switzerland, in Denmark, in the UK, a little experiment in Spain, a little something going on in Canada. In fact, I think there's a special session on that on Canada later. You know, and then Portugal, no heroin maintenance, no coffee shops, changed the policy in, I think, 2001, and almost nobody's, really, Portugal, you know? And then, two, three years ago, these reports come out, 10 years of Portuguese drug policy, of decriminalization in public health, and my God, things have worked well. So, Joe, tell us a little something about how that came about and how you feel. I mean, you've been the pioneer, and he actually will be receiving the uh, Norman Zinberg Award together with his institute on Saturday night. So, you know. But I'm honored to have you here, but tell us a little bit about that, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ethan. Hello, everybody. Um, well, the story of the drug use or, or the drug problems in Portugal uh, has, has some similarities with what happened in Czech Republic. Uh, as, you, as you know, we lived during uh, 50 years under a fascist regime attended with our carnation revolution, as you can remember. It happened in 74. Before the revolution, we had no problems with drugs. <laughs> uh, we had a very tough regime, uh, and uh, only some elites had uh, access uh, to, to some substances. Suddenly, everything changed with the, the end of our colonial war and the return of people, uh, soldiers and settlers from Angola, Mozambique, and all, all that people, we had some habits of using at least marijuana. And they brought literally tons of it into, the, into Portugal, and the, it was a sudden spread of experimentation. Uh, and differently from what happened in other countries, and I think this is a key element to explain how things uh, uh, evolved later, uh, it spread over all social classes. It was not a problem of only of uh, disorganized people, but it, uh, uh, the prob because it was easy uh, to shift along with marijuana, suddenly we had an invasion of heroin and uh, cocaine, everything. Uh, uh, and as we were completely naive about, about drugs, I can tell it uh, with my personal experience. I was 20 at the time, and I remember that people, mm, 
sitting together and experimenting a joint of uh, marijuana and someone said, oh, I have something new, do you want to try it? And it was heroin. Okay? And we were completely naive about that. We knew nothing about drugs. It was easy to shift from one to, to the other. And this led us in uh, one decade to an enormous spread of problems caused by heroin. Okay? Uh, in 10 years time, we had 1% uh, of our population hooked on heroin. We are around uh, 10 million, quite stable, and we had 100,000 problematic drug users of heroin, mainly injecting drug users. This, along with the beginning of the AIDS epidemic, uh, led to a dramatic situation. But as I told you before, it, was, it spread among all social classes, not only the most uh, disorganized or marginalized people, but also medium class, even high classes. And uh, the movement uh, of considering this is not a, cri a crime, this is uh, something, uh, th this is a health issue, started from the uh, beginning. Because people, and it was almost impossible to find one single family in Portugal that had no problems uh, wi uh, with drugs. Uh, and people used to say, well, my, my, my son is not a criminal, he's someone who needs help. So uh, this led us to a position even if, uh, uh, accordingly with the, with the conventions, we criminalized drug use uh, and drug possession, it was never uh, really prosecuted by, by, by the system. And it was quite, uh, quite, easier, quite easy by the end of the 90s, uh, to including in a, a global strategy for drug use, uh, with the development of, of uh, all kinds of responses in terms of prevention, arm reduction, treatment, facilities, uh, reinsertion, and so on, it was quite easy to, uh, to present the proposal of decriminalizing drug use and drug posse and, uh, possession for use. So it was passed in the, in the late, well, the strategy was approved in 99, and the bill uh, on decriminalization was approved in 2000. Uh, what uh, I I it's important to say that uh, in the discussion of that uh, issue, uh, we had a very important personality that was uh, George Sampaio, our former president of the Republic, who recently uh, joined the Global Commission. Uh, and he uh, is uh, helping us very much to, to stand on what, what we got. Uh, in my view, this was important, uh, this decriminalization, because it, it, it is the, the recognition that is, this is mainly a, a health issue and provided us the, the, the possibility of spreading uh, a set of responses, uh, mainly in terms of arm reduction and treatment all over the, the country and uh, uh, allowed us to, to uh, decline all the, the uh, all the figures of the bad impacts of the drug use in, in, in the country. Just uh, two words to, to tell you that uh, we put, uh, using drugs is no more uh, a criminal offense, uh, but is still prohibited to use drugs in Portugal. So uh, we have a kind of administrative bodies that uh, evaluate drug users. If police get uh, seizes, uh, picks someone using drugs, uh, he presents him. Uh, these, are what you, these are what you call the dissuasion committees? Dissuasion committees. Yeah, a wonderful name, the dissuasion, <laughs> yeah, dissuasion committees. Yes. Uh, and the, the, they can apply some penalties, but the main idea is to uh, evaluate the needs of that, uh, that person. Is uh, the, the, the person I have in front of me a drug addict in need of uh, any kind of help, and I help him uh, uh, finding the, 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 the help he needs? Uh, it's uh, just an uh, occasional or recreational user. Uh, I try to evaluate if there is any kind of uh, needs in terms of family situation, social situation that can be addressed. And so I try to, uh, uh, to address that person to the adequate responses on society. And this, uh, uh, this, system, this system has been very effective in uh, uh, 
identifying really uh, uh, situations that along with drug use can lead people to problematic drug use. So it's a kind of a second line of preventive intervention. Uh, and this, it has, uh, now we have uh, 12 years of this system put in place and we have a very good, uh, a very good uh, evaluation of the, what is uh, happening there. So yeah, thank you. I, I, for those of you who want to read more, um, a few years ago, the Cato Institute put out a good report on this. It's actually by Glenn Greenwald, who has since become quite famous uh, in his work on the, on the, Snowd the Snowden story and such. And that one mostly emphasized more of the decriminalization side and not so much the public health perspective. Then there's a fantastic article in the British Journal of Criminology a couple of years ago by Alex Stevens and Caitlin Hughes, a very scholarly assessment that showed very good findings of this. And if you look outside on the table of the Open Society Foundations, you'll see summary booklets summarizing the Swiss and the Portuguese and the Czech and I think uh, Dutch drug policies. So you can find more about that. When I'm oftentimes asked, what's the real difference? I say in America, if you get stopped with drugs and don't have a big criminal record, Maybe you get one or two chances, right, to get clean. And then, sorry, we got to put you in jail. In Portugal, you get one or two, and another, and another, and another, and another. There's a commitment to doing everything possible to not put people in jail for simple drug possession. And it's not about, you know, <laughs> and as somebody, I think your colleague once explained, Nuno, that it, we don't, it's not that we send people to drug treatment. We say, go to the health clinic, because many people struggling with addiction don't want to go to get treatment tomorrow or today, but everybody has a reason to go to a health clinic, and that that can be a useful place to do this. Is that basically yes, correct? That, yeah. that's, okay. it. that's it. Well, Thank you for, yeah. for your help. <laughs> let, let me turn now, because, you know, all of a sudden, out of the blue, you, all these Latin American ex-presidents, current presidents are proposing a change in the regional global debate, and I'll come to that in a moment. And then almost out of the blue, in Uruguay, a little country of what, three or four million people, right, between, what? 3.3 million people between uh, Brazil and Argentina. You know, the president, Mojica, former Tupamaro guerrilla from the left, not the right in this case, says, let's talk about legalizing marijuana. And look a year and a half later, and this could actually happen. Diego, why did he do that? Why did he do that? Well, and what do you think is going to happen yeah, next month? Thank you very much, Ethan. First of all, thank you for the invitation to be here in the, in the state of Colorado and in Denver. Second, excuse my English. I've not practiced my English for a long time, so I forgot some expression on words. I have my friend Fernando have an excellent English and told to me and help to me about that. So first of all, I, I, I want to be here for several reasons, but one reason and I start with that, is to say congratulations for the people of this state of Colorado and the city of Denver about you passed this referendum in the last uh, month. That's great for us. Really, it was, uh, for us, it was a great news, uh, you know, because uh, the United States is not only an important country in the region of Latin America, it's around the world in this issue. But what happened in Uruguay is, is different. That's an, it's not related about the United States situation. What happened in Uruguay is, uh, is it's very complicated to explain because it's very simple. The president, uh, we, uh, of course, it's not, a, you know, it's not one, one decision because we have a, a decision in the middle of a package of different policies. I'll try to explain you in five minutes. Uruguay is the first country that we pass a, a law uh, that we allow abortion in the country a few months ago. We allow the sex marriage uh, in the country. We are the second in the country in the region. We are the first country in the, in the region that we allow adoption of sex marriage a couple, so we have this also in the country. So I know that we are always under the radar, and we love to be under the radar. That's a problem to us now that is a big delegation of Hawaiian here from the, our drug uh, commission and for a member of the parliament, the two key, the key guys that are working very hard to pass this law, uh, Julio Bango and Tati Sabini. But a true story that we have a story of progressive society. It's, not a, it's possible because we have a story behind us that is to create this kind of change in the country. That's the first step. It's not an isolation idea of the president. Secondly, what happened? Well, we, we start to have a, a lot of problems to increase the narcotraffic problem in the country. Not like Guatemala or the other countries. It's the, for example, the average of murder in the country is lower than the United States and it's lower than the average of European countries. 
But in, the, in our society, so quiet, full, very peaceful people, to start to have a, big, a problem that increasing violence in our, in our, um, in our fel in, in the criminal uh, felonies. In the one discussion that we have that, at the parallel of that, we have a discussion about marijuana issue, like the United States, medical issue, to use in medical uh, uh, in the marijuana, uh, recreation or not, and about what is the impact in our uh, judicial system, and so on. But one day, we were discussing about that, the president said, well, in the council, we have a council of ministers, and then we have a, a cabinet of security and different cabinet, and we have a cabinet of production. And in this cabinet, the president started to discuss about uh, why, why we don't legalize marijuana, don't create a, a change of this policy. Uh, we don't have an answer. Different ministers start to say, well, um, who opposed this here in this table? No one. Why, so why we don't change? What, is, what happened here? Because we, we believe strongly in, in the evidence, in the public policies. We are from the left party, but we are very pragmatic guys. Because, you know, we understand that, you know, one of the problems of the politician, and I'm a politician, the guys who knows about this issue is the guys, Julio Calzada, the Secretary General, and only the politician that is, is strongly support these ideas and this process in the government. But the first step is that our, the politicians, we fall in love with our mistake, often. Why? Why we fall in love with our mistake? We know, we know why, because a politician needs to convince the people. This is our life. We need to convince people every day, uh, not only in campaign, every day that we, li we live, we need to convince people to different ideas. So when you became a government, you are so convinced, because to convince people, you, are, you need to be so convinced in your ideas. And then you try to deploy your ideas, and the reality shows you that you are wrong. And you, what happened with that? The first reaction of us, the politicians, is to insist on our idea, because reality is wrong. Because my, uh, it's not possible that I'm wrong. That's, that's what happened with, with us. So, but this is, this is an, we, we, you can understand that. <laughs> but, that, what happened when you have 40 years the same policy and you, have the, and you don't have good results? Why we don't change? We are stupid guys, the politicians? No. No, because there is a real problems. And I try, because it's very easy to speak here. My friend Fernando, I have a very close relation with Fernando, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Guatemala, former planning minister. He, he said to me a few minutes ago, it's very easy to speak here because all of you support marijuana legalization. Yeah. So it's very easy. But the true story, that we are politicians, we need to know what happened in the society to push an idea. And the true story that 40 years of the same speech in the society, in the whole region, in the media, in the political discussion, in institution, in a, a lot of uh, advertising doing that, create a unique vision about this, uh, this problem. So at the beginning, we said to the president, okay, we all agree with that, so do it. That's the president Mujica, it's a very particular guy. So ask you really mean, so open mind. And he said that, okay, if this is, don't show us result, we need to change, so change. That's so simple, and we start to change. We start to create the condition to say, send a bill to the parliament. But at the beginning, we have a lot of problems. Don't believe that this is a dream, only a, you know, a paradise story. No, we have a lot of problems at the beginning. Political problems, we have conservatives. Of course, not like the conservative in the Czech Republic, but, <laughs> but people tend to go against that because the majority of the population in the, in the first polls say that they are against to change the policy. 60% of the population. So there is a lot of political politicians that say, okay, time for opportunity. They start to speak in the, in the TV and of course in the media to say, this is a madness idea of the, of the government, the, the poor Mujica, he lost his mind, how we can legalize this possibility. And then we start to talking about, well, it's not the legalization exactly, we create a strictly regulated market because we study a lot what, what is the best way to the country. And we have a lot of help, a lot of people are sitting here of Hof Eaton and the DPA and a lot of other institutions. And we learn, we, we, we hear a lot, we listen. What happened in other parts of the world? What is the best approach to change that? Our best approach, we need to, the next step is to create a strictly regulated market with, by the state. And we, we tried, to, we, we studied the Netherlands, the Dutch, but we are Latin people. We cannot do that the Dutch do. What, no? <laughs> Because the hypocrite of the, the, the Dutch system is incredible, but it's, they can do that. The Anglo-Saxon or, or uh, the Anglo-Saxon people in British, they can do that also. No, we don't can do that. We don't, why not? Because when we study, the, the, the law in, in Netherlands said that drugs is still illegal, illegal, but you can consume and you can 
by, but you, can, you cannot uh, produce. And so, you know, the, 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 the one of the jokes said that the, the queens uh, uh, no take the taxes in the front door, but they don't know what happened in the, in the, in the, in the back door. And you know why? Because it's a system as it works, Ethan said to me, it's better the hypocrite system of, of Netherlands than the prohibition, and I, I agree with that. But it's better when you say the truth. We need to change. Yeah. What happened with that? Why we need to still continue with that? Why? Because we have a convention. That's the biggest discussion. Oh my God, we have a 1961 convention in the UN and said it's forbidden to create and to create something law that allow marijuana recreation or something is not from uh, in scientific research and medical purpose. Okay, that's true. So what we say? We need to change that all. That's the truth. If not, what happened in this country? Because my president asked, I say, well, what happened in the United States? Well, president, at the federal level, is not allowed to consume marijuana or even uh, 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 another drug. So. And said, okay, but why would I, I read that you have some state that have marijuana? No, well, president, there are 18 states with medical marijuana. And what it means? Well, you use when you have a medical problem. Okay, but then when you have a report from Oregon, from California, that you can use your, your, your you can buy marijuana only with a, a lot of excuse. The president said, I don't like to lie. <laughs> uh, I don't like to lie. We, why we need to create a, a liar system? Uh, we need to speak with the truth with the people. If the people don't support us, it means that the people are not, not, not well prepared to change. And it this means that this is our work, like politicians, to make the change, to change the reality. But don't lie to the people. Say the truth. We need to change because we fail in the political, in the policy that we followed the last 40 years to create a better society in the treatment of drugs. That's a true story. It's so a we very, need to change. It's a very finally, unusual. Finally, Diego, it's a very unusual approach to being president. No, I mean, well, since when do presidents say, "Let's yeah, just tell them the truth"? I mean, yeah, no. Well, <laughs> you, you need you 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 met the president yeah. in New York, and the president is 78 old man, and it's. Uh, it's, you, you met the guy a long time, so, and it's a very particular story. And it, so it's a guy who is, how you say in English, that is por encima del bien y del mal. It's uh, above good and yes, it's above, above, uh, above good and evil. You know, it's, it's a guy who have a, some relation with this kind of issue. That it's possible that they they have the will to change. But finally, I want to say all of you that you are activists and that it's not easy for the political will to have the political will. To change. Why? Because the polls show difficulties? Because the true story is that we don't know if this is the right direction. That is true. I, I know that you don't like this. But when you ask to us and say, well, this new law, because in our law we create a strictly regulated market, but we legalize the production, we, we regulate the production, the, the, the harvest, the commercialization, the, the point of, of, of sale, how, how the household, how, how many plants you have in your house, how many, the, how many people, how you have in your clubs, and also how is you, the, 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 you regulate the market. But the, what is the question here for the, the, that problem? You must understand that the first step is political will. It's not enough. But the true story, when you tell you, oh, well, I, we agree with you, we want to do what we cannot do, it's bullshit. Uh, sorry, my English is bad, but I know that is much <laughs> very clear. Uh, uh, Perfect. The truth is that if you want to change, if you, if you say that you want to change, and you act in consequence, you're still beginning to change. So this is the first step. So I, I think that in Uruguay, what happened? Well, we have a, a president that's so different. Mujica is the key player in this change. And then we have a... The idea that we need to change because for us, it's a double vision. First of all, because what is the main drugs in Uruguay? Alcohol, it's a legal drug. What are the main problems with drugs in Uruguay? Alcohol, the legal drugs. What are the second drugs in Uruguay in consumption? Tobacco. What are the second problems in, in drugs in Uruguay? Tobacco consumption. We have 4,000 people dying because consequences of tobacco consumption every year. We don't know, but we don't have 400 people dying with uh, marijuana consumption in the country. So the third drugs in consumption in Uruguay is marijuana. And we ask, why we treat 
and we create a, a strictly related market in alcohol, a strictly related market in tobacco, and we say the same in marijuana. So the true story is that we create, it's not a big change, it's we need to handle marijuana exactly that we handle the problem of tobacco and alcohol. Because for us, marijuana itself is not good or bad. It's bad if you have an addiction. The same addiction you have in alcohol or the same problem you have in tobacco addiction. But we need to be make visible what is invisible. To have very good public policies to treat that, because to, to handle that, because tobacco control is very hard in Uruguay. We are one of the leaders in the world in tobacco control. And we have a lot of problems because of that with international company like Philip Morris. We have a very big trial and a, a process of arbitration in Seattle, in ICSID, in English, in the World Bank with, with uh, Philip Morris. And, but we think that it's a sovereignty of the country to protect the public health. And for us, public health is above the drug uh, conventions. And this is most important for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, before I, turn, before I turn to Fernando and put this in a more international perspective, you know, New Zealand, I mean, nobody, it felt like nobody was paying attention. And then all of a sudden, along comes New Zealand and does something that seems remarkably radical. I mean, they basically say, we got an issue here going on with young people doing all these club drugs, what's being, being called alphabetamines and all this, and we don't know. It's and, and, and there's this gray market industry, and, and, and what do we do? And the government and the industry say, well, maybe we should figure out a way to set up a regulatory process and, like, control this. I mean, and Ross, it's extraordinary. So. What exactly happened here, and what do you think is going to play out? Well, can I, thanks, Ethan. Can I first um, acknowledge the First Nations people who have traditionally occupied this land? Um, thank, you. thank you. I'm not only the token non-government person, I'm the, the token guy that has the short name. So it's Ross Bell. <laughs> <laughs> nice, and, nice and easy. I, I, thought, I thought to answer your question, Ethan, it's best I give a chronology of how we've got to this place that we have in New Zealand because I think the story, everyone says New Zealand is quite unique. I, I actually think that when I tell the story, a lot of people will see that it's quite similar to what the US is facing and to what a lot of other countries are facing. So I don't think we're too different. All I think that's happened in New Zealand is that our politicians have run out of patience faster than your guys have. So about... About 10 or 11 years ago, um, a smart person realised that if something, if a chemical wasn't listed in our Misuse of Drugs Act, which was passed in 1975, so if a chemical wasn't on the list of banned drugs, then it was by definition legal. So what's stopping me from coming up with chemicals that aren't on the list and, and putting them on, onto market? So the first, the first substance we had on market was a, was a drug called BZP, or benzylpiprazine, which was kind of an ecstasy slash amphetamine mimic. And, and this, this, this drug, sold in pill form, was, it was on the market for a long time because it wasn't illegal, and, and therefore it was sold with no control. There were no age restrictions, there were no warning labels, and, and these kind of things. And for a while, this wasn't a problem. But then clever people realised that they could also be selling this. So what we ended up happening with BZP was that within a couple of years, um, you could buy these drugs, um, this product, from a corner store. We call them dairies. You have them as 7-Elevens. So you could walk into any store, you buy, your, buy your lollipops, and buy your drugs. Um, the media, you can see where the story is going, the media caught wind of that, and, and communities became concerned that you could, school kids could go into these stores and buy these drugs, and so all of that usual noise that you see around these new, new drugs started happening, and so uh, our drug policy minister said to his experts, tell me what I should do with these drugs. Shall I ban them? Because in New Zealand we have a group of experts who, who assess a substance and give advice about whether it should be a class A, B, C, <coughs> or whatever drug, and his experts came back and said, we don't know enough um, uh, about this substance 
to give you advice on where it should be scheduled. But what you should do is create a new category within our Misuse of Drugs Act that we can put these new chemicals into. So actually in about 2006, New Zealand created a regulated market. So you could put the, the, these, these, these new chemicals would, would be um, placed into, uh, well, let's call it class D, uh, kind of a holding pattern, and we can have things like age restrictions, health warnings, and so on. Um, and so this law was passed, uh, and it gave the officials um, uh, powers to create a whole lot of regulations to, to, to deal with these drugs. At the same time, the, the, the drug policy minister said, and we need to invest research into identifying what are the problems with this substance. Long story short, that drug, BZP, um, became banned. New advice came back from the experts that said, actually, we think that this is a more problematic drug. It, it needs to be scheduled as an illicit substance. But the industry who had been making all this money said, hang on, if you do that, they're a bit silly, the industry, but... It's another story. If you do that, we will have a new drug to replace this product the very next day. Um, anyway, BZP was banned. Literally the very next day, a new product hit the market. And this is what you'll all recognise. So that drug was banned, and a new product hit the market, and so on and so on. Synthetic cannabis came along. We banned some products, and new products came onto the market. And so the drug policy minister got a bit sick of that and said, we need to review this thing. Let's review a whole drug law. So a group of independent experts came, conducted a review, came back and said, we need to fix up this regulated market. So what we now have, um, what we've just passed in, in, in August after all of this work, is a law, it's a, it's a new act, it doesn't sit in the Misuse of Drugs Act, it's a new law that says to the industry, um, the, the, the burden is on you, if you can develop a product Prove to us that it's low risk, and here's various hoops you'll have to jump through to do that. We will let you sell these products, but we will sell it under very tight controls, the same kind of controls we have around um, alcohol and, and tobacco. So that law was passed um, uh, a few months ago. It took effect a few months ago, and it was passed in Parliament by 120 votes to one. So, so you think, oh, okay, so we've got a whole lot of political consensus here. So anyway, we are, we are the first country to try to regulate all of these new, these new chemicals that are coming along. The drugs themselves, I think, are going to be a little bit dull. You have to remember New Zealand's far away. We're a small country. We're not a big market for drugs like cocaine and, and heroin. So we have, you know, we have these things instead. So the drugs themselves that they're going to come up with aren't going to be that great. Um, but, but, what, but what this thing has enabled us to do is it, it, it very quickly highlights the, the glaring failure of prohibition because what we've found is that you can't just ban something because the, the clever people in the industry can, can cook something new up and so it's kind of fast-tracked the kind of debates that we need to have around what should a reform system look like so I think that's the value of the New Zealand model is that it's allowed us to have a conversation about, well, prohibition ain't cutting it, what's the alternative? Hey, Ross, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I think we have, a, there's a session, right, on, uh, that's paying a lot of attention here. Is it, did it already happen or is it coming up? Later on this afternoon. So if you want to know a lot more about the New Zealand uh, session, go to that one later. So what I'm going to do is turn to Fernan uh, Fernando in a second. Um, uh, and then, then I'm going to move this conversation more quickly with quicker answers and a little more di dynamic interaction here. But the way I want to frame this um, is in two ways. First of all, to say that when I met Fernando for the first time in February of last year, I will tell you that in all my years as a professor and an activist, I have never seen somebody learn the ins and outs of drug policy with such sophistication and nuance as quickly as he did it, and he did it while he was serving as a cabinet minister. So absolutely extraordinary. Um, the second thing I want to say is that, you know, most of what we've heard here has been, you know, countries relatively small in size doing their own thing, not actively, you know, President Mojica is not out there telling everybody to do what Uruguay does, the New Zealand, you know, the Czechs. Basically, we're doing our thing, trying to do it right. In Guatemala, you know, domestically, they're beginning to try some interesting things. 
But I'm looking at this thing, and here you have a former general, head of military intelligence from the conservative right, gets elected president about a couple of years ago, and he stands up and he says, we need a fundamentally different discussion that might include putting all options like legalization on the table, and this is a regional and global issue. Fernando, why did he do that? And what's it been like with him playing this international leadership over the last year and a half? Okay. Thank you, Ethan. Um, thank you, everybody here. Um, that's what I said to Diego, that I have never seen a crowd so enthusiastic about drug policy reform. Um, <clears throat> I go to international fora where there are governments um, discussing this, and um, they are quite aggressive sometimes against the idea, sometimes they are passive about it. Sometimes they support you, but they tell you in secret they, they support you, and they cannot say it publicly. But it's because um, fundamentally the issue had become a taboo for governments to debate. Okay? And the most important thing with President Otto Perez is that <coughs> he decided he had to break that taboo. Okay? And the taboo is that governments cannot debate drug policy. That's the taboo. You people, activists, civil society, whatever you want to call yourselves, you can discuss that. Academics can do that, you know? Uh, people who have no governmental responsibilities. But those who have governmental responsibilities cannot debate drug policy, okay? They just need to apply the formula that exists for the last 60 years and is about prohibition and the war on drugs, okay? And if you want to break that, it's because you are completely crazy. Okay. It's absolutely crazy, okay? Because that's what you do when you are part of a civil society, you're an academic, but not when you are a responsible government, okay? Uh, why President Otto Perez decided to open his mouth on this, being a sitting president, not a former president. Uh, uh, we have a visit a few weeks ago from president, former President Samper from Colombia. And he said to President Otto Perez that the best thing in the world that can happen to a person is being a former president. Okay. It's a great thing. <laughs> you have all the protocol that is given to presidents. You have all the relevant importance that is given to presidents. But you don't need to sign anything, and you don't need to say anything really substantive. And the only problem uh, Mr. Samper said to President Otto Perez is that in order to be a former president, you have to be a president first. <laughs> so that's the only real problem with that. Okay? So he said, well, resist as you are a president because then next you're going to have a nice life as a former president. Okay? But anyway, why being a sitting president, he decides to say something? Because yes, he was a Guatemalan army general and he was the head of intelligence of the army 20 years ago. And when he was there, he had a strange opportunity of doing something unusual. He found in Guatemala territory a guy who was a very important uh, drug dealer called Chapo Guzman. Okay? And he found Chapo Guzman, and he said, well, <laughs> we found the guy, incredibly, but we did. He communicated this to the U.S. and the Mexican government. And all of a sudden, we have done something tremendous. And he imagined that by doing that, he had done, I mean, he had completely uh, won the war on drugs, OK? Because you have Chapo Guzman. I mean, it's, you capture Hitler, OK? So you, you have Hitler in your hands, the war is over. As simple as that, you know? Well, he captured Chapo Guzman. He was sent to a Mexican prison. And a few years after, Chapo Guzman left his prison in Mexico on the front door, you know, after paying nobody knows how many millions of dollars to everybody in the jail. And he went for free, and he's still free today. Uh, moreover, Chapo Guzman today is listed in the most important wealthy persons in the world by Forbes magazine, okay? It's in the top 50%, 50 percent, 50 people that are wealthiest in the world. So Chapo Guzman is stronger today than 20 years ago. And President Otto Perez said, well, it was like we have won the war. But 20 years afterwards, what we have is that the guy we capture is stronger than ever. Okay? Something is wrong. 
And that is done by, um, that is said by someone who was involved in a war, a civil war, a very bloody civil war that we have in Guatemala, a terrible civil war. And he understood immediately that if his opponent was stronger today than 20 years ago, it's because the war on drugs is failing, as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Well, realizing that was good. Saying that in public was something different, okay? Uh, because that has been said by many people, to tell you the truth. Because president Otto Perez was not the first one to say it, okay? He was the first sitting president to say it, but not the first one to say it. So he said that in public, and all of a sudden everybody started to ask him why he meant, what he meant by that, okay? And he started to tell this story about Chapo Guzman all the time, you know? Um, Diego was saying, yes, politicians tell stories so that people understand things, okay? Um, they are not experts or university professors or anything. They just need to tell stories like, like Jesus, Jesus did in his time, you know? Tell the story to people so that people understand what's going on, okay? So he told the story of Chapo Guzman several times. I heard him. And I, I was the Secretary of Planning, the Ministry of Planning in Guatemala. Economic planning, so I'm an economist by training, uh, nothing to do with. Well, unfortunately, he said, fortunately, in my opinion. But anyway, I'm an economist by training. So I turned to him and said, I worked 14 years in the United Nations system, and I can tell you something. If you want to change the drug policy paradigm that exists today, it will take you ages to do that, okay? It will take you ages. And I gave you an example. The Convention on the Rights of the Child, a very well recognized convention in the human rights world. It took 14 years to negotiate at the UN. And it created a consensus among more than 150 countries. So the most consensual convention on human rights has taken 14 years to be approved at the UN. So reforming the system may take, I don't know, no less than 10 years to 15 years, maybe 20 years, okay? So why are you doing this, president? You have four years as president. And that's it. And he said, well, I guess someone has to start with this. Okay. As simple as that. Okay. I told him something else. I told him the story of the peace process of Central America. Uh, the peace process in Central America started really in, in a big uh, fashion when the presidents of Central America agreed in 1986 and 1987 that we have to have peace in Central America, which, which is what is a process that is called in Central America, the Esquipulas process. But the peace accords in Guatemala were signed 10 years afterwards, in 1996. And I told him, you see, you can be the first one to be at the Esquipulas, but you are not going to be the one that is going to sign the end of the war on drugs, okay? And he said to me, well, I signed the peace accords of Guatemala. I can start you know, a process of peace in a different way now, okay? And I'm not willing to be the one to sign this time. I can just start and wait for the movement of the world to come, okay? So with that decision, I told him, okay, well, I tried to be reasonable with you. What are you going to do with the US, okay? <laughs> and he said to me, well, we're friends with the US. Let's try to talk with them. I said, okay. <laughs> He's a good guy. Okay. I, actually, I was not very sure what was going to be the U.S. reaction. But I was not a foreign minister, so I was happy. You know? I didn't need to deal with the U.S. I was the Ministry of Planning. So. Perfect. So I said to him, well, as a Minister of Planning, what I can do for you is help you in collecting information. And that's where Ethan says that I started to study everything. And my iPad got you know, completely full with documents on this. I, on a, on a specific subject that I have never tried before, I had to read, I don't know how many pages. Uh, I remember that my iPad had 400 documents at a certain point that I read uh, in trips and uh, overnight, you know. I started to read at 2 o'clock in the morning, finish at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, just to understand what's the issue really about. And there are three things I learned. And these are the only three things more or less we know about this. Okay? One is that in order to prevent people from consuming something, you don't prohibit the consumption. Okay? Okay. 
if you want to prevent people from consuming something, and then you put a lot of taxes so it becomes so expensive that it's difficult to buy. Or you alert people through education, or you do both things, you know? But you alert people about education. You tell them tobacco is bad because it's going to produce cancer, okay? And you create a whole legislation that regulates that. But you don't prohibit tobacco, okay? And you do not allow tobacco to be sold legally because you believe tobacco is good for human health. You don't do that. You know it produces cancer. But we do it because if we prohibit tobacco, then we create, that's the second lesson learned, an illegal market. Okay? And when you create an illegal market, you create a black market, you create a mafia that is going to run that illegal market. Problem in Guatemala is not that we have a large market of marijuana and a large market of, consum of consuming cocaine. Problem of us is that we are right in the middle between the consumers and the producers. Okay? So we need to dismantle the market, the illegal market. Okay? Otherwise, we will continue to have the same problem all the time. And the demands from those countries that have consuming markets is that we need to stop drugs from getting into their borders. And it is reasonable to control consumption, but not to prohibit consumption. Okay? So the paradigm is failed completely, has failed completely. It's a flawed paradigm, okay? And it is based on false assumptions. From there, we decided that we had to move not in the domestic market of Guatemala, but the international arena, okay? And that we need to go and debate this worldwide, not just in the region. For several reasons, and this is the end of my story, is we move very quickly at the Organization of American States, and the hemispheric level. And we realized that we have a chance to do that. There was something unusual that happened, is that Guatemala has requested to be the convener of the General Assembly of the Organization of American States in 2013, this year. And because of that, because we were the convener, we were the ones that suggested the topic for the assembly, okay? And President Otto Perez turned to me and said, don't tell me you have a second topic. <laughs> Well, uh, I thought I was talking about the foreign minister's task, so I said to him, yes, yeah, said drug policy, no problem. The foreign minister, we have to deal with that. And, well, all of a sudden, I have to change in the cabinet post, and I moved from secretary of planning into minister of foreign affairs, so I had to face the music, okay? <laughs> and I have to preside that general assembly, and I have to go and talk with our friends in Washington, and all the stuff that I thought was not my job, okay? <laughs> So be careful about what you say when you are in government, okay? <laughs> Whenever you reach government, yes. It's, it's, you may say many things when you're a free person, but when you're in government, yeah, as, as a former minister of the United States said, you are locked in the cabinet, okay? So you are locked there, really, okay? So that is a real issue. So I have to face the music together with President Otto Perez on this. But the real interesting thing is that we started a debate that is rational, okay? It was not based on ideology position, ideological positions. We were not saying, we want this because we don't like or we believe that these values are different. It's just this doesn't work, as simple as that. So, so it's a pragmatic issue, yeah? So it doesn't matter whether you are liberal, conservative, left-wing or right-wing. It's a question that doesn't work, okay? And you need to find a solution, okay? And the solution is not to prohibit. That's the only thing we know so far. So we're not saying, so we're gonna take this, thank you. We're, we're going to go past 1.30, because we started late, and I'll count on all of you to get into the rooms. We'll, we'll go to, take this longer and get into the rooms for the next thing at 2 o'clock on time. But what I want to do now is to move this more quickly, and I'll be cutting some of you off and getting quick answers. But Liz, the first question I have is, so the U.S., right? I mean, how much, you know, Obama's changing, there's a little more openness. The Cartagena summit last year, he said he'd be open to stuff. I don't see any pressure on Uruguay, but then again, our drug czar was visiting in Portugal and that sounded so good, and I don't know if there's been any reaction to stuff there. And in Guatemala, I mean, it's not all been easy. So just a, a sentence or two from each of you about what it's been like with my government. 
Zhao, do you want to start? Or I was going to say Zhao, and then, yeah. Well, yeah. well uh, I met uh, Mr. Karlikovsky. He was, he was very interested, but uh, in the end, I, I think we didn't impress him too much. Uh, uh, I, I can tell you, I, I did my best, but <laughs> uh, I think he, he was not very enthusiastic by the end. Uh, I think someone pointed, uh, there are still some, some people in Portugal that opposes our policies, and uh, he went first to talk to that people. Uh, then he came to me, and he was quite skeptical, but uh, in fact, I have no, uh, no idea so of that. Yeah. yeah, and Diego, in, in, in Uruguay, no pressure, right? Well, you know, we, we, we are lucky because Montevideo is the fastest capital to Washington is in Latin America. So we are the fastest, yes. And we are out of the radar of the United States for a long time. God bless us for a long time about that. And it's very important. But the true story that we have conversation with the United States, the United States government about this issue, not only at the level of the Department of State with the guys who is running the, the, the drug policy, we talk directly with a member of the White House and they ask us about their try to be involved to more information about what happened in Uruguay. And we thought we have a very good relation. We are the left party in the government, mm -hmm. uh, left party, and, but we have a good relation with the United States. And I think that, and I cannot open speech here because it's a public, uh, because we have responsibility in our government, <laughs> some conversation that we have, but uh, it's important to say that. This is all off the record. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, no, I know, no, it's off the record. No, no. But I can, send you, I can send you this message. I think that the people in Washington know that it's changing so fast, the society in the United States. They are not stupid. Don't, don't think that Washington is stupid. They are the people that are intelligent. That's, they, they need to manage different approach and different interests. But they know that the, change, the time is changing. Yeah. So one of the big problems of this country is you have a mad system. Uh, uh, every member of the parliament, every congressman have election every two years. So it's, uh, and you change the district in the uh, state assembly every two years, and you have a system that is very complicated to, to create a, a national agenda of that. I think that one of the big message was when the president of the White House decided to note, use the prosecutor general to overrule the state of Colorado and Washington decision in the Supreme Court. I think that this is a big step, because it means that we start a, a discussion that is, is pro it's possible that you have a change in your policy in the next year. So it, this is the reality in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I think that is the problem is that the United States is not the big problem in this, pro in this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't want, I think that the position of China and Russia is the problem. Yeah. And yeah. an international level. No, not a, so let me, and for now, in Guatemala, not much of a problem with the U.S., right? Or a little, or? I think it's completely different because we are, very close yes, to the U.S., <laughs> okay? But there are th several things. One is that the U.S. government, as any government, has many faces. It's not just one face, okay? And one speech or one discourse, okay? In any government, they finally reach a consensus about something, particularly about important issues. But I would say that in drug policy, you have diverse versions within the U.S. government. And within the U.S. State Department, different versions. In the Pentagon, they have another story. Kierlikowski in the White House has another story. And, and you need to manage that diversity of opinions and, and try to make a sense of what, what is possible within those differences that exist. But it wasn't that easy at the beginning. Um, um, Guatemala receives more or less once in a while some important senior people from the US. But uh, in less than three months, we receive uh, the head of the uh, home, home, um, Napolitano from Homeland Security. Yeah, that's uh, a Homeland Security, Napolitano. We had Kirlokowski, which was the nicest, I guess. <laughs> uh, we had also the head of INL, of course. At the State in. Department's Narcotics Division. Yes, and, and we have Joe Biden, the Vice President in yeah. Central America. Okay. So, so much attention in such a little time was due to something. Okay. <laughs> and, but what was important and, and this is what has to happen, because Guatemala is not, and is not uh, interested on, becoming an, an opponent of U.S. policy in general terms. We are a friend of U.S. policy in many dimensions and in many areas. And this has been 
an issue for many, many years. It's not that we started with that with President Otto Perez. So the fact that as Colombia, as Mexico, and as Guatemala, we are, let's say, allies of the US up to a certain point in many dimensions, this creates a completely different way of dealing with the issue. Mm -hmm. Because at the beginning there were many questions about if we were moving into something opposing the US in broad terms. So then you become a threat to US security, you know? But our position was, uh, we are, we are friends. We're part of the same team in many ways. Colombia is a strong ally, maybe the strongest ally of the US in uh, Latin America. Mexico is a strong ally of the US, or Guatemala is as well. So it's more a debate about among friends. And, and there's an expression that uh, you have in English, and I heard it in the 80s, when President Oscar Arias started with the peace process in Central America, and Oscar Arias from Costa Rica, and Newsweek had a, a front page, a cover page with him, saying, tough words from a good friend, okay? So we started to say tough words to a good friend, okay? We started to say things that maybe some people in the U.S. government didn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. But we are friends. So it's tough words from a good friend. And I think with that approach, that we are saying something tough, but not from an aggressive position, not as a security threat, that created a whole difference. Well, for, and now for, we have a dialogue. Okay, well, let me ask you, and I'll turn to interest on this, which is that, so this issue of the international conventions, right, the single convention, all this, and there's a lot of perspectives on this, right? Some will say, ignore it to some extent. I mean, when Switzerland and other European countries move forward with safe injection and heroin maintenance and they received letters from the International Narcotics Control Board, and they basically, the government's responded, you have your lawyers at the UN, we have ours. <laughs> other people say, you know, there's actually a lot of flexibility within the conventions. But then I hear some of you talking about we need to change the conventions, right? Now, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, Mujica, President Mujica is not out there publicly, but you said the convention may need to change. You know, Otto Perez, what he's talking about, ultimately convention. And, you know, and Indris, you've played a role, I think, in, in the European circles in being a sort of provocateur on some of these fronts. So why don't you just answer about what you think is going to happen or what can happen with these conventions? Well, uh, I would like to hand my cards to my colleagues. <laughs> Politicians. Are you a consultant? No, no, I'm national uh, <laughs> drug coordinator, which is uh, the drug czar, as you call it here in Czech Republic. So, um, in Czech Republic, it's a highly political role. Uh, so, why don't we meet up in Prague <laughs> with uh, our prime minister? And, uh, I love Prague. <laughs> and uh, uh, the ministers, minister of foreign affairs, and discuss the issue of what do we do for next CND meeting in March in, uh, uh, in uh, yeah. Vienna. Yeah. Well, when I raised this issue in, in, in our European circle, uh, the eyebrow, eyebrow goes up. <laughs> Isn't that right, Joe? <laughs> but uh, uh, I believe strongly it is a time to start pushing it. I spoke uh, recently informally to, to the officials from the US side, and uh, we decided to start an official debate on at least amendment of single conventions. Single convention, because <coughs> I said, come on guys, it's time for you to walk out of the battlefield with the head up. Isn't that right? So, uh, and they said, yes, we like the idea, let's do it. <laughs> I suspect it's because they want to control the situation, but I think it's better to pull those people in because uh, I think at this moment, as you said, the biggest opposition at the end of the day is not going to be US, it's going to be China, it's going to be Russia. Mm -hmm. So, and I think it, this, this part of the world is in, 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 in the area of public health, extremely dangerous. We have today uh, about two million people in, in uh, Russia injecting drug users, 1.5 million HIV positive. 
WHO, the, the World Health Organization, says today the biggest threat in HIV epidemics is in Russia. Among injecting drug users, following Ukraine, 700,000 uh, HIV positive among injecting drug users. We have to change this. Mm -hmm. These people travel the whole planet. They go and buy houses and parts of towns in Europe, in Spain, Portugal, I believe, in Czech Republic. Uh, in Czech Republic, we are very proud of having uh, uh, the policy so so uh, um, successful that there is no HIV among among injecting drug uh, drug users. There is the the hepatitis C dropped by half. But the, but when we go and test the Russian speaking community, it's totally different. Mm -hmm. So I think, come on, this is a this is a but, ticking but you know, bomb. What you're suggesting is with the Russians and the Chinese and others who are forceful. Is there really a I mean, the, the, what what one would hope for? would be a sort of alliance among the more forward-thinking Latin American governments, right? You now have Santos in Colombia, you have Alto Perez, you have Uruguay, hopefully in Chile with a new election there'll be somebody sympathetic there, maybe Costa Rica, a few others. Then in Europe, right, you have a whole, you know, from Portugal to Switzerland, maybe Denmark, maybe the Poles are moving along, the Italians. Is there actually some I believe, effort to create I will a... Believe, I believe, even though the, the people in the European uh, Union don't don't see it yet. I believe uh, we'll pull, pull them all in one united voice at the end. Uh -huh. Which end? <laughs> <laughs> which, which? which end? You mean the end of this year or in the end uh, a generation? I hope in, uh, the end of this year for uh -huh. the CND 2014. Uh -huh. The end of civilization. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> in yeah. the end of yeah. civilization. Yeah. Yes. And, and Ross, <laughs> New Zealand, has there been anything in terms of international pressure, negative reaction, or is it positive interest, or anything well, along those lines? Nothing from the US, because they're still pissed at us for the nuclear ship ban. Um, <laughs> but absolutely internationally, and I think that this is, you know, while the, these new substances aren't, you know, so awesome, they, they do highlight the need for reform. And so we've had Fedotov at the, the head of uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, talk about the New Zealand model in very favourable terms. Um, at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, countries have passed resolutions saying with all of these new substances that are a big challenge uh, to, to all countries, we need to look at alternatives to the, to the rate, it wasn't, I'm paraphrasing, you know, we need to look at alternatives to prohibition using consumer protection law or medicines law or, or regulations like New Zealand. And so I think the, the, these, the, the, these new substances have highlighted that the whack-a-mole approach to drug control isn't working and so I think it, it, is, it is getting countries thinking about having to do uh, new things. I think one of the challenges though, and it might be a, a, a risk that's not a, actually a problem, one of the things in the New Zealand model is that we're going to know a whole lot more about the substances before they go on the market, the industry has to, to, to present a whole lot of information. Now the way that drugs can be scheduled internationally is that the WHO provides advice to the, to the UN on where they sh should be scheduled. So what could happen with the New Zealand model is they could grab all of the data about the new drugs that we've got, help them to you know, give advice to the UN to schedule these things so our system could collapse if suddenly all of the drugs that we have are, are, are listed as scheduled drugs in the, in the treaties. Uh-huh, Well, I just want to add that uh, the biggest trouble we had was not with the US officials, it was with uh, UN uh, control body, the INCB. So uh, yeah. obviously, we had the inspector of INCB, which was the former yeah. uh, US diplomat, though, right. uh, Mr. Uh, Is there an argument for abolishing the INCB? <laughs> no, uh, I think the INCB should be... That, by the way, you know, the INCB for those who know, is the International Arcata's Control Board, and it's essentially the, the, the organization that sees itself as the watchdogs of the International Convention, but they've defined their role in a very, very, very sort of retrograde conservative fashion, and that's been the problem. Yeah. Well, what they do, they usually, uh, when, for example, we had the 2010 uh, uh, part of the penal law, changed into government having a uh, power to decide the amount which is not on the criminal uh, uh, offense. Uh, it was the reaction of INCB straight away. Uh, but the, when we asked the INCB, so why don't you watch the whole convention? Uh, uh, why don't you look at uh, areas of uh, uh, demand reduction uh, services 
uh, accessibility to, to, to healthcare. They said, well, that's not our role. Uh, so they witness situations such as in, such, a, such, a, such happened in China, I don't know, it's five years ago, in, during the International Day Against Drugs, uh, they held public executions for drug users. People who were once in treatment, mm -hmm. second time shot in the head publicly. And INCB was quiet. Yeah. So I think if that control system is there, unless there is one uh, option for the president to do in funny, five, four years, to just step out the, con the, the convention totally, that's another option, I yeah. think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> but yeah, me, if not, if, uh, we, if we are here to pr um, present, um, uh, preserve the, the control system, then the INCB has to change totally into uh, yeah. yep. areas like human rights, uh, treatment. So, sp okay, spreading the, 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 the... And there's some discussion here, I think Damon Barron and others have been talking about the conflict between the international drug conventions on the one hand and the international human rights ones on the other. But Diego. Yeah, yeah I think that the, the first step is that we have a lot of people that are thinking that it's necessary to change. That is good. But it's not enough. Because as my friend Fernando said, we know that it's a very long process. Don't believe that we start a discussion all change this convention and we have this change in two, one, two, three, or four, five years. We know it's a more than 10 years discussion at the United Nations level. Why? Because there is a lot of people that's in favor of this change that have some of threats because we don't know the results of the discussion. It's possible they have a very bad convention in 10 years. So we need to know exactly what's the way to, to manage this. I think that the next uh, event is not in March in, in Vienna. I think that 2016 is our main goal to start this discussion, is the special session of General Assembly. And we are working together with some countries on, on Latin America and at the level of European countries, talking and working politically to create another kind of environmental to discuss these, these, these problems and to discuss how is the way to start a discussion about the, the evaluation of the convention in the last four years and what is the result of this convention. I think that, as you said, the first step that we, when we start this kind of discussion at this international level is not the only things because he's the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Chief of Staff. We have a lot of issues with the different countries. This is one issue. It's important. Yeah, yeah. But it's not the main problem for the, this. So we need to put in the table. No, the no, whole no. There's only one and issue. Yeah, so no, right. no, no, no. No, but we need to know that when you discuss another government at an international level, you have a lot of different issues and you need to know how is the priorities in different times. So finally I say that I think that the best way is we need to change in the special session of the General Assembly, the mood that we are discussing this, this is the first step. And, and we are working very hard to move from Vienna to New York, some part of the discussion is very important for us. It's symbolic that we need to discuss in New York and not only in Vienna at this point of view, because the staff, the people who, who work in Vienna for a long time, they have a, a, some interest, some vision that is difficult to discuss. And I think the best step is, at the same time, it's possible to discuss some amendments to create some more flexible position and to allow some countries to say, okay, we share the objectives, the goals of this conviction, mm -hmm. but we need to have the possibility to okay. have another way. So, to so let me finish up by asking this question because we, ha we have to clear room in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, is it, here's what worries me a little bit, right? Now, on the one hand, you know, Jindrich has described in Czech Republic how under multiple governments, the policy continues. It's fairly stabilized. But you just had a change of government in Portugal. And Mujica leaves next year, and Otto Perez in a couple years, and Santos has an election. And I worry a little bit, especially in Latin America, that it's being driven by courageous presidents who are out ahead of their public opinion. You know, in Portugal, you have some concerns here. We've seen in the Dutch, when a center-right government took over, they almost tried to sh shut down the coffee shop system. They didn't succeed. But, and so how much do you think this momentum is really building and is going to continue beyond the, lo the, the terms of your presidents? And that will be the, the last question. So with quick answers, please. Uh, Zhao, first, just quickly about Portugal and then. Yes. I think uh, that the political situation in Europe and in particularly in Portugal, for instance, uh, I, I don't believe uh, that's a strong political will to push forward. Uh, in our case, we are much more concerned in keeping what we got until now, uh, because uh, just to tell you, uh, the, the Portuguese government now is supported by the same coalition who voted against the criminalization. Uh, I think uh, 
well, they are not, they already declared publicly, they have no intention to uh, go back, but I don't believe they go forward, okay? So our, our role in this moment is to step on what we got. Uh, and I, I believe uh, most of the European countries are facing the same kind of situation. They have other kind of concerns, the, the financial crisis, the social crisis, and the, the, the drugs uh, question is not uh, an issue now. Uh, but I believe that uh, with Latin America pushing forward and uh, with those movements with that those we will, are watching now. And I will it continue? Uh, yeah. Will it continue three, four, five years from now when Mojica is retired and when they're all ex-presidents joining the Global Commission on Drug Policy? Will there continue to be uh, this movement? Uh, in Guatemala, if Fernando is the next candidate, we, we are sure that yeah, it that continues. Yeah. Okay, don't count on that. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, no, I think the question will be, in the case of Latin America, what is creating the momentum that is sustainable is the process of the OAS. Okay? Because the OAS is an established international organization. And it really is prepared to, pre to generate a process that is going to dialogue with the UN on how to change policies. And I'm really amazed that uh, how far we have moved in the last 18 months at that level. Okay? So I think the sustainability does not come from internal sources, but from international sources. And, and I see the OAS playing a fundamental role. And yes, there's going to be change of leadership up to a certain point. Fortunately, mm -hmm. we are democracies, not dictatorships, so we have the possibility of changing our leaders, so that's not a bad thing. But I think what is happening is that now we have an international growing consensus at the hemispheric level. And I can tell you, you know, um, even the U.S. government, as you know, has started to change certain positions. Yeah. So, so it's not that things are going to go back to where we were. Okay? I think we have already pushed the car, the, the car a little bit farther, and I think it's not going to return. Okay, well, we'll need to. Let me just say here, before I conclude this, um, I need to note one thing. There is a, this is probably the first multi-person plenary at a Drug Policy Alliance conference in which every panelist has been a man with lighter skin complexion. There are various reasons why that was the case here, but in this case, I hope you understand that part of this is the countries that are leading the way, part of this is chance, part of this is that we had an unusual opportunity to have five incredibly courageous and wonderful people up here to tell us about what's going on in the world. So please join me in thanking them for leading the way on drug policy here. Thank you.